few weeks ago, uh, we began a series called Get Rich Quick. And um, interestingly enough, this is the kind of the, the, the way that our culture uh, thinks about life, really. You know, is there any way that I can get rich quick? You know, can I just do the lottery or do my numbers come up? Or is there a, is there a scheme, you know, that I can get plugged into, you know, some kind of pyramid thing or something so that I can get rich quick. But what we've called this series is Walk the Path Less Travelled because we want to flip it on its head because we don't think that richness comes from what you get, but we think it comes from what you give. And so we looked a couple of weeks ago at love uh, and love is, is when you give love and when you serve. And this morning, to, to set this kind of theme up, I want to ask you a question this morning. How many of you love bread, like freshly baked bread? Anyone? Anyone you're out there if you're watching online as well? We love freshly baked bread. It's so fattening, isn't it? But it's so nice. And when you get that fresh loaf of bread, you think, oh, I'm really going to enjoy that. And then I don't know whether you do like what we do in our families, that we forget it and we leave it. And when we come to see it, so I, can I share this with some of you guys at the front? Not looking like you want that. You see, what's happened is that we haven't consumed what we have. We've just held on to it. We just like hoarded it. So now it don't look appetizing, does it? Nobody wants to eat that at all. And it's like, We've been given something for something, but what we've done is we've held on to it way too long. Now, what I'm going to say next is a little bit cheesy, but this I'm going to credit this to where it's come from. Andy Stanley, who's from North Point in Atlanta, we're now connected to that church, and so we get access to that, and it's brilliant material that you're going to hear this morning, but this is his line, so if you don't like it, blame him, okay? Because basically, what I think God would want to say to you and I this morning is this, start giving while you're living, because what you're holding is molding. Told you it was cheesy, didn't I? Start giving while you're living because what you're holding is molding. And basically, if you're not a follower of Jesus this morning, this is going to be quite a hard-hitting message, okay? And I make no apologies for that. And some of the stuff I'm going to say, if you're not a follower of Jesus, doesn't apply to you yet. But for many of you who say you are a follower of Jesus, this is right where you're at. Because I believe, and, 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 as I sh- and I'll show you in a minute, I think the Bible says this as well, that God has given us stuff not just for us, but for him and for others. And if we don't start giving while we're living, what we're holding is molding. And so what we've looked at the last couple of weeks, we looked at love in week one. And then last week we looked at the word serve. And this week we're looking at the word give. And what does it mean to give? And, and, and we are going to talk about money this morning, but, but it's way bigger than that. It's way bigger than that. Okay, and so to help us to do that, we're going to look at a little letter in the, in the Bible, because the Bible isn't a book, the Bible is a library of books, 66 of them, and one of them right in the end part in what we call the New Testament, that's like after Jesus, was a guy called James, who was the brother of Jesus, and he writes to the first century church. Now, some of the writers in the Bible really kind of, they're very poetic, and they like very nice language, oh, that's so lovely, that's so nice. Not so much James, okay? He is very, very hard hitting. So James chapter five, verse one, um, it says this. Now listen, you rich people, to which everyone looks round, don't they? Now I want you to know this is to you this morning. And if you're watching as well or listening, this is to you. Listen, you rich people, to which I guarantee most of you think, I hope they hear it. I hope those rich people listen to this this morning. Those rich people out there, that rich person next to me, that rich person behind me, that rich person in front of me, I hope they listen to what Leon is going to say this morning because they really need to hear it. He's talking to you. He's talking to every single one of us. And here's the thing with this phrase. Now listen, you rich people. The thing is, we don't feel rich, do we? None of us feel rich. So we don't think we are rich because we don't feel rich. You know, the only time I've ever really felt rich, I don't know whether any of you remember this, some of you young guys might not be here yet, when you got your first paycheck. Anyone remember that? Anyone remember the first paycheck? That was the moment when you felt rich because maybe you, you were still living at home maybe or you, you didn't have bills, you didn't have, a, you didn't have a mortgage and you had some money and it's all for me. And that's the time when you feel rich. But we don't feel rich now. One of the reasons that we don't feel rich is that we have no margin. 
So, so not for all of you, maybe, but for many of us, maybe we have more income coming in now than we've ever had, and yet we don't feel rich because we have no margin. Because here's the thing that happens. The more that comes in, the more goes out. We don't have any margin. The other reason that we don't feel rich is that we compare ourselves to everyone else. So on social media, and we see it and we think, look at the holidays they have and look at the holidays I have. So I don't feel rich and look at the house they have and look at the house I have and look at the car he drives and look at the car he drives and look, and they've got smarter kids and cuter wives and maybe that was too far, that one. <laughs> and so we look at these other things and we compare ourselves, and so we don't feel rich. But here's the thing. If you have a household income of around 30,000 pounds, you are in the top 1% of the world's richest people. And that may not be for every one of you here this morning or watching, but for most of us, it probably is. And so when James says, now listen, you rich people, I think he's talking to you. And I think he's talking to you. And I think he's talking to me. But we don't feel rich. And that's part of the issue. Now, what I'm going to do this morning is, is not to make you feel guilty, but I want to make you feel responsible. I want to make you feel responsible. You see, Mark Batterson, who's a great author, he, he says it this way. God doesn't bless us to raise our standard of living. He blesses us to raise our standard of giving. And this is true like for you young guys, and you may not be earning yet, but you're getting some money from somewhere. All right, hopefully it's what your parents have given you and you haven't taken it, but that's a different issue. But you've got something and you start to think, actually, I'm blessed, the house I live in, the place I live in, the stuff I have. And I'm blessed not to raise my standard of living, but I'm blessed to raise my standard of giving. And that's so, so important. And you see, when, when James wrote this in the first century, there was an assumption in the world then that if you were rich, you were blessed by God. And if you were poor, you were the opposite. So basically the rich people are the people that God likes and the poor people are the ones that God is displeased with. Now that's an assumption that was never right. In fact, when you read the whole of the Bible, and I know the whole of the books of the Bible is difficult. I'm going through the Bible in a year at the moment, so I'm right in the middle of Leviticus. Woohoo! Really loving it. And so loads of stuff on sexual relations and different things and all that. You know, ask me anything, I've got it all sorted. Not. Um, but in the middle of that, even in that hard to understand ancient literature, right from the beginning, God says things like this. Hey, the weak among you, the poor among you, the disadvantaged among you, the marginalised among you. Don't put them on the outside, put them on the inside. Don't put them at the back, put them right in the middle, put them right at the front. Honour and value the foreigner among you as if they were from your own land. That's all the way through the Bible. And the Bible says those who don't have much, you're not to look down on them. You're to raise them up and to encourage them and to lift them up. So, so important. In fact, just a few, um, just a couple of weeks ago now, in fact, two weeks today, uh, we came back from India and we shared a little bit of that um, it, at the vision gatherings. But one of the things that we did when we went out to India is we went to this place here. Um, it's going to come up any minute now, the leper colony. Thank you. And we went to this gr beautiful group of people um, affected by leprosy. And um, they call it a leper colony. We wouldn't use that language. We'd say people affected by leprosy. But when we went, these, these were a beautiful group of people who were living in incredibly poor and difficult situations and circumstances. In fact, if you go to the next, next screen, uh, Chris, you can see uh, some of these guys and girls, and you probably won't see just because of how close it is, but many of them don't have fingers or toes. In fact, this picture here of this lady had kind of like one leg and a, or a half a leg and, and, and was literally dragging herself across the, the concrete floor to get to her home. And it was so, so overwhelming, just gathering around her and praying for her and not knowing what to pray. But you know, one of the things that, that really impacted me and, and I know us as a team was about the location because, because there was the, the colony and right next to it was a, a Hindu temple which was incredibly rich and opulent and massive and lots of gold and like millions of pounds goes into these places. It's frightening. And right next to that was the leper colony and right next to that was this garbage dump with wild pigs like this one here. In fact, I went in to take a picture and that pig there chased me out. But I ran faster than the pig and I am here today to tell the story. And there's the garbage dump and there's these people in the middle, in the middle of the temple and the dump. In between the temple and the dump are these people. 
And the only people that go and visit these people are people who love Jesus. And it reminded me that, you know, in the book of Exodus, it talks about when the children of Israel are passing through, are walking through the wilderness, and there's a great little bit in there where it says, and those who are weak and disadvantaged among you, don't put them at the back, put them in the middle of the convoy where you can circle your wagons and protect them. And would a community be judged on how it treats the weak and the disadvantaged and the marginalized and the poor? And we don't stick them at the back, but we put them right in the middle where we can center the wagons around them. And it was really moving to us to go and to, and to see these people. And you know, this assumption that James is writing into is like, hey, hey, if, if you are weak and disadvantaged and marginalized, it's not because God is down on you. And if you're not, and if you're rich, you're rich for a reason. And it's not just for you. It's for God and it's for others. So next Sunday, next slide, please. We have Compassion Sunday. And this is great. And little fellas like this and girls like this all around the world are help, you know, Compassion as an organisation, um, help lift children out of poverty in Jesus' name. They have two million children that people are sponsoring and helping um, uh, around the world. And last October, Alison and myself had the privilege of going out there with Compassion to Ghana, looking at some projects there. We were really impacted not only by the work on the ground, but by the, we met three young people in their 20s who um, we saw where they lived and they've been through the Compassion program. So someone sponsored them and they've now graduated. And one of them um, wants to go into politics and one of them wants to go into media and one of them wants to go into IT. And all of them love Jesus, but all of them have been lifted out of poverty and have got a different view and they want to help lift their communities. And so next Sunday, we've got Compassion Sunday and we are partnering with Compassion um, for a project in Tanzania. I know many of you already sponsor kids through Compassion. If you don't yet do that, please don't do it yet, okay? Because we'd love to encourage you to think and pray about next Sunday about sponsoring a child in a community in Tanzania that we are going to build a link with over the next few months and years. Eventually, we want to go out there, send teams out there, meet some of the kids that we sponsor. And the reason that we want to do that is that we have been so blessed. And you see, if you don't start giving while you're living, what you're holding is molding. And just think about how many kids like this kid here, we could help lift out of poverty rather than hold on to it just for ourselves. So let's go back to James. And I did warn you, okay, because I've only done one little few verses here. This is hard hitting stuff. So James says, now listen, you rich people. Weep and wail because of the misery that is coming on you. Woohoo! How many of you are glad you went to church this morning? Your wealth has rotted and moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. Subtle, isn't it? Subtle language. James is basically going for it. And he's really going for it really, really strong. And he's saying, listen, you've got stuff and you're just holding on to it and you're hoarding it. And it's corroding, it's molding like the bread. How many of you have got that drawer in your house where you stick all your old stuff in, like your phones? Anyone got one of them? I had a new phone this week and um, I hate new phones because I hate that whole process, okay? But anyway, that's just me being technophobe. But I've got this new phone, and, and new phobe? No phone. Uh, and, and I opened a drawer and I realised I've got loads of old phones. Like why on earth have I not given them away? Why on earth have I not sold them and used the money because they just stick it in a drawer? And how many of us do that? Maybe because of distraction or busyness, or maybe we hold on to our stuff because actually richer people, and that's all of us, we don't quite trust the God who provides. We'd rather hold on to our stuff ourselves. And there's something about that right there. But you see, poor people don't do that. People who don't have much, they don't do that. They have a joy and they have a a trust in God. And I've been in so many communities around the world, in India and Africa and Asia, and places where there's such incredible poverty, and yet there's such an incredible richness. You know, one of the things we as an Indian team, we came back thinking we don't want to lose that sense of, of just joy and presence of, of a God who provides, even when you don't have much, but of trusting Him for your daily bread. So, so important. You see, this eating your flesh like fire is typical judgment language. And really what it's all about is it's all about um, this idea that you've been blessed to be a blessing. When you've been given much, much is required. So I think James would say, so start giving. Start giving while you're living because what you're holding 
is molding. Now, James thought like this because James believed in life after death, okay? And I know for some of you, maybe if you're newer to the whole faith thing, you're not quite sure about that. When you believe that this life is not all there is, it opens up your perspective on life. It really does. And James believed in life after death because his brother Jesus told him about life after death. And then he watched his brother Jesus get killed and he watched his brother Jesus get buried and he watched his brother Jesus rise again and talk to him. So James knows that there is a life beyond this life. That's why what we do with our stuff in this life really echoes into the next. It really does. And that's the whole point of this. Now, we have to wrestle with some stuff. We are rich. And folks, it doesn't make sense to hoard on to our stuff now. Because if we don't start living while we're giving, what we're holding is molding. You know, as, as I said earlier on this week, it's been a big week for us as a family. And Mom passed away last Sunday. My father died 11 years ago. And so so with, with mom as well, that's the whole thing. And going into the house, and we went into the house again yesterday and looking through some stuff and starting to get ready for the funeral. And I came across mom's bank statements and, and mom's stuff and, and the way that she gave and the way that she lived. And, and I look at that and it so impacted me because mom and dad didn't leave us loads and loads because they gave loads and loads while they were alive. They gave it to us and they gave it to other people. And we didn't realise until dad's funeral and now coming to mom's how many people they helped. And when I look at that, I think, guys, that's the kind of inheritance I want. Don't give me loads more stuff. It's just stuff. Give me loads more stories. About living life differently. About giving and loving and serving. And it's so, so important. And then James in verse four jumps back in. Look, the wages you failed to pay the workers who moved your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. In other words, what James is saying there, guys, you had so much, you had so much, but you're looking for loopholes with all the stuff you have. You see, that's what people who have a lot always do. Here we go. Resource people shouldn't look for loopholes to get by with doing less. Resource people should look for opportunities to do more. And, and I think we've established that most of us in this room, most of us watching are rich by the world's standards. So we're resource people. So we shouldn't be looking for loopholes to get by with doing less. We should be looking for opportunities to do more. And listen, if you're not a follower of Jesus, that's for you as well. That's for you as well. What are you doing with what you've been given? But if you are a follower of Jesus, lean in right now, okay? Because this is really for you. I've been a pastor of a church for a long time. I have heard all the loopholes out there that resource people who say they follow Jesus use when it comes to money. Here's number one. I don't have to tithe, give 10% of my income because tithing is Old Testament and that's under the law and now I'm New Testament and I'm under grace. Fine, don't do it. But, but if under the law, 10%. Surely now that you're under grace and not law, you'll be giving way more to God and His work than you would be under law, wouldn't you? Not. It's a loophole. It's a loophole that resource people use to get away rather than opportunities to do more. Another one is that, but, but I've earned all the money. All the money belongs to me. You see, the Bible is really clear on this. The Bible commends hard work, but commands us to be generous. We don't own any of it. It all belongs to Him, isn't it? When we give our lives to Jesus, we come into that understanding that all that we have isn't ours. It belongs to Him and He gives it to us. He lends it to us, not so that we can hold on to it, but so that we can give it while we're living. And the other one, I think, is this one. But yeah, but I just, you know, I just, I just can't afford to give. You know, when this happens, then I will. Or when this happens, if this happens, then. Listen, I understand all that. Just make a start. Just make a start. You see, here's what someone said years ago. I don't know where I got this from. People give not from the top of their purses, but from the bottom of their hearts. If you desire to become a more generous giver, don't wait for your income to change. Change your heart. Do that and you become a giver regardless of your income or circumstances. 
And then James lands a knockout blow, a knockout blow in verse five. You have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened yourselves in the day of slaughter. This is nothing to do with slimming world, all right? This is a whole different context here. You have condemned and murdered the innocent one who was not opposing you. Oh my goodness. This is really hard language. And that, that phrase, fattened yourself, in the first century, no freezers, no fridges, okay? Only things that keep are wine, grain and animals, okay? No fridges, no freezers. So what they would do is they keep an animal and they fatten the animal up for a time in the future when they're going to have a feast. Some of you might have heard that story, the prodigal son, son that runs away, comes home, father embraces him, kills the fattened calf. That's what this is referring to. And the idea here is that, is that James is saying, but you fattened yourselves up for yourselves. That's what you've done. What you've done is you've held on to all this stuff and you've hoarded on to all this stuff and you've fattened yourself and look at what's happened to the stuff because you should have been giving, broken the bread. You should have been giving while you're living because what you're holding is molding. And he says it with such powerful and strong language. I think what James is saying is that we can become a victim of what I want to call the consumption assumption. And the consumption assumption is basically this, that if it comes to me, it must be for me. See, this is the Western dream. And this is the Western, I think, this is the Western lie or the Western, um, you know, I don't know, I've lost the word really. Uh, but basically, this, the assumption is if it comes to me, it must be for me. Why? What about if it comes to me, it must be through me? What about if it comes to me, it must be for others through me? Wouldn't that be an amazing way to live our lives? <laughs> As an aside, James probably writes this um, around AD 62, 63 and dies around that time as well. And seven years later, um, Jerusalem comes under a siege and you get the fall of Jerusalem in AD 70 and many uh, historians, not biblical, but outside of the Bible, say that many Jewish people died holding on to their gold and their wealth and their money. And he says, you fatten yourself, for what? For what? You know, here's the reality, right? Most of us will run out of time before we run out of stuff. You know that, don't you? And actually all the stuff that's like, oh, look at my house. That will be somebody else's house one day. Oh, look at my car. Someone else is gonna drive that. Look at my clothes. Someone else will wear that. All that stuff is just stuff. But the stories that we get to tell, the lives we get to impact, the legacy we get to leave, that comes not when we hold on to our stuff, but when we release it for God and for his work. I want to finish with just four application questions. Number one, do I embrace the fact that I'm rich? And maybe you think, well, I don't have 30,000 bad income coming to my house, so then I'll, I'm all right. But hey, the point is that by the world standards, we're rich. Secondly, do I realize that all I have is a gift from God and I am a steward, not an owner? It's come to me, but that doesn't mean it's for me because I'm a steward. Three, are my hands willing to stay open and give or am I holding on? Am I shoving stuff into the drawer rather than releasing it? And four, does my current giving reflect who I say I am? And this is the hard one. If you say you're a follower of Jesus this morning, does your current giving reflect who you say you are. When I looked through some of my, my mum's stuff yesterday, I thought, that's who you are. That's who you were. You can tell it by someone's bank statement. What would they say of mine? What would they say of yours? Does my current giving reflect who I say I am and whose I say I belong to? And you know, you, you may be thinking this morning, yeah, but that's, that's all very good, but I'm not so sure about that. Let, let, let's look at this. this. I use this quote so much. How we use our money demonstrates the reality of our love for God. In some ways, it proves our love more conclusively than depth of knowledge, length of prayers, or prominence of service. These things can be feigned. That's an old word. It means faked, okay? They, you can just pretend. But the use of our possession shows us up for what we actually are. You see, we can all say, oh, Jesus, I love you. You're so amazing and I feel so great. But actually, when it comes down to it, the way we use our stuff is a better indicator of what's going on in our 
heart. These are old statistics, but I think they're real. One in 10 people who say they're a follower of Jesus give 10% or more to their local church on a regular basis. Four in 10 give 5% or less. Three in 10 give to the church only when they come. One in 20 don't give anything. And only four in 10 have said that they decided how much to give on a weekly basis. Does that reflect who we say we are? I don't think so. You see, this, this phrase here, your money, your money's direction shows your heart's affection. And so when you look at where your money goes, it shows where your heart is connected as well. Let me just very quickly give you four stages of, of a giving. You have a self-absorbed owner, someone that just says, this is all mine and it's all for me. Then you can move to an obligated owner. It's all mine, but I'll give to God because I know I have to. And like I'll tip. And thirdly, you have an obedient owner where no, it's still all mine, but I'm going to like do the 10% thing and I'm obedient. Or you can have the one that I want to get to, to be a love-inspired steward, where all that I have comes from God. And it's not for me, but it's through me. And what does God want to do with it in the world? And I know some of you, you, you might say, oh, that's all very well, Leon, but I've got some current circumstances, like I'm out of work, or it's difficult, or I've got a partner who's not a follower of Jesus, and I get all of that, and I understand all of that. We want to help you with that. Start where you are. Just make a step. Or, or, or maybe you're saying, I don't quite know how to do it. I don't know what to do. You know, you, you've got uncertain practices. You know, we'd love to help you with that. It's complicated these days. Some of this stuff is. We have so many different ways that you can give to God through this church and, and let alone things like compassion. And we know that, but we want to help you with that. And so on that next step card that you've got, okay, there's a little box on there just to tick that one box to say, I want to talk to someone about giving and someone will contact you and help you with all of those processes. You know, for me, I think firsts are really important. So, so, so I, want, I want to say as a follower of Jesus that I want to put God first. I think the first day is really important. So for me, Sunday is really important. Sunday is a worship day. It's a day to gather together. You know, here's the thing. What did you miss church for? No, what did you miss in order to come to church? That's an interesting way of saying it, isn't it? So for me, first is important as a family. If you don't put Sunday first as a family... You're in big trouble when your kids later on, honestly, because you want them to have a relationship with Jesus, but you didn't put it first neither, so why should they? So firsts are really important. The first day of the week is important. The first few minutes of a day giving to God are important. And for me, the first bit of my income that comes from God, I want to give back to God. That's why it's so important. And when you give in a consistent, recordable way, not only is it better for you, but it's better for us as a church. Because not only then can we budget, but also when you give and you pay tax, every £100 you give is worth £125 to the work of God because the government gives £25 gift aid. So for doing nothing other than giving in a consistent, recordable way, you increase the amount that you've given for the work of God. You know, I, I was so inspired um, this week as I was thinking about this and thinking about my mom and my dad, but then thinking wider than that. And I heard of a church in the US, and I've got to get these figures right. Now, this is different in America because of medical insurance, but the church in California paid five and a half million pounds to pay off the medical costs of five and a half thousand families in their community. Did you get that? They raised five and a half million dollars and gave it away to pay off the debts of five and a half thousand families. And I thought that was amazing. Then I found this, a church in Cincinnati paid 46 and a half million dollars to wipe off the debt of 45,000 families. That's amazing, isn't it? Is it only me that thinks that's amazing? That's, that's incredible. Could you imagine? You know, and that's not saying, oh, we'll wipe off your debts if you then come. No, no, no. Sort of, we'll wipe off your debts because we've raised this money and we've recognised that God has brought us stuff, but it's not for us, it's through us. And we, we want to wipe off your medical debts. How incredible could that be? You know, in week one, Jane made a comment where she said, um, Jane, who was speaking a couple of weeks ago, love is what love does. And I think that's so true. And love is only love when it does something, when it serves and when it gives and when it reaches beyond our walls. So I want to invite the band to come back up. And this is my go-to quote often. You can give without loving, but you cannot love without giving. And so I want to invite you this morning, and whether you are a Christian or not, um, whether you've been on this journey a long time, especially if you say that you're a follower of Jesus, 
Does your current level and current way of giving reflect who you say you are? And it isn't to do with how much money you've got. Statistically, those people with more money give less percentage than those with less. It, because we hoard and we hold on and we keep it in our drawer and we want to leave it to our kids and I get all of that. But what we do, rather than start living when we're giving, is we hold on and it goes mouldy. And James and Jesus, I think, would say, hey, there's a better way to live. There's a richer way to live your life. There's a path less travelled. And it starts when you give. So I want to invite you to stand. Can we stand? And in a moment, we are, yep, you got it. We're going to take our offering. And in the offering as well, there's also an opportunity for you to take that next step card that you've got on your seat with a pen. And you can take your next step and and, and if it's a giving step, then just check that box, tick that box and pop it in the bucket. Maybe it's something else as well. Maybe it's something else. Maybe you want to talk to someone. Maybe you want to think about getting baptised. Maybe that's your next step because you love Jesus and you want to get baptised on April the 5th along with other people who are getting baptised. That would be amazing. But as, as we do this, I want to encourage you to, to make this a response that's a worship response, Okay. And I'm not, not, not just like singing a nice song, but a worship response. That's your life. And say, Jesus, I want my giving to reflect who I say I am. I want to start giving while I'm living. I don't want to be holding on to this molding stuff. But I want to make a difference. That's get rich quick. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you so much that you held nothing back from us. You loved, you served and you gave. You loved, you served and you gave. God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, His best, so that we could have a relationship with You. God, having started <laughs> in this whole kind of way, God, please forgive us when, when we go inward and when we get tight and when we get selfish and when we get consumer. And God, I pray that You help us to stay open, stay trusting, stay giving. And God, everything that comes to us is not for us. It's through us and to a world that desperately needs it. So God, would you help us? And I pray, Jesus, for next Sunday when we have Compassion Sunday and we get inspired and hopefully many of us will take on the challenge of sponsoring a kid in Tanzania and the difference that could make to their life and their family's life and their community's life and, and the richness it could bring into our life as well. So God, would you help us? And now as we respond through song worship, through giving, through taking our next step, God, I pray that you would move in power and that we would be a church that's a generous church that becomes radically generous, that we, we are known in our community for being generous beyond our walls, not just for our own people, but for beyond our walls. God, may we have a story in the future of maybe wiping off people's debts or blessing people just ridiculously and radically. God, help us, I pray. Pray for our young people, Lord, who are brought up in, in such a crazy consumer world. God, may our young people, when they go to school and college and uni, may they be radically different by the way that they live out their life and with whatever we've got that we're holding on to. God, we won't want to hold on to it. We want to release it into you and to your kingdom and your work. So Jesus, help us, I pray now in your name. Amen.